Hello, everybody. So far, we've been talking about macromolecules. Those are the really big molecules that have a backbone of carbon. And these are the molecules that make up you. They make up living cells. We've talked about uh, proteins. We've talked about lipids. And we've talked about carbohydrates. But we haven't talked about nucleic acids yet. Nucleic acids consist of DNA and RNA. You're probably more familiar with the term DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. It's what's found in the nucleus of every cell in your body, and it contains the information that makes you, you, basically. So it's the information needed to make proteins. If you remember, proteins do all the work in the cell, so then the proteins go on and they make the carbohydrates and the lipids, etc. They do all the stuff that they have to do. But what determines what you look like, some aspects of your behavior, etc., comes from the information that's contained in DNA. And of course, we pass that down from generation to generation. RNA is kind of an intermediate. It's a messenger. So DNA serves as a template to make RNA. And then RNA is used by ribosomes to make protein. In this topic here, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to the structure of DNA and RNA. And in our next topic, we'll go into detail on how DNA works and how DNA makes you, you. Nucleic acids store information and the information they store is information needed to make proteins. So they're responsible for storing that information. Proteins are made and then the proteins do everything else. The proteins make carbohydrates, the proteins make lipids, etc. Nucleic acids are responsible for storing and transmitting genetic information from generation to generation. So the nucleus within a cell contains DNA. And people quite often compare the nucleus to the brain of the cell. I don't really like that analogy. I think of the nucleus as the library of the cell. The nucleus is a massive library filled with lots of books. And each one of those books is a gene. And each gene is the manual for manufacturing one specific protein. So DNA is the storage device for that genetic material. These are the blueprints. Ribonucleic acid, RNA, is going to carry information from the nucleus out to the cytoplasm, out to a ribosome, where it can be decoded to make protein. So let's have a quick look at the structure of nucleic acids. Like other macromolecules, they're made up of monomers that are stuck together one at a time through dehydration synthesis. The monomers are known as nucleotides. And you can see one here. So a nucleotide consists of three parts, a phosphate group, a sugar, a pentose sugar, which just means it's got that pentagram shape to it, and also a nitrogenous base which, as the name suggests, contains nitrogen. We have a number of different nitrogenous bases. So in DNA, we have cytosine, thymine, adenine, and guanine. In RNA, instead of thymine, we have uracil, and then we have the other three. There are two types of sugar. In DNA, we have something called deoxyribose, and in RNA, we have ribose. You might have heard of Watson and Crick. A lot of people mistakenly think that they discovered DNA. They didn't actually. Um, DNA was first isolated back in the 1800s, but they were able to figure out the structure of DNA. So they looked at a lot of research by other people, pieced it all together, and gave us the model that we have today of DNA. And they referred to DNA as a double helix. A helix is a spiral. So basically we have two strands wrapped around each other. And if you're looking for a fairly short, interesting science book to read, uh, they actually published a book called The Double Helix. And here's the structure of DNA. So again, it consists of two strands that are twisted around each other. On the far right, you can see the space filling model. That's about as close as we can get to you know, a realistic um, interpretation of what it looks like. But on the far left is how you're more likely to see it in the textbook. The blue 
represents the backbone of the molecule, which consists of the phosphates and the sugar. And then the nitrogenous bases are in the middle. And it's kind of like rungs of a ladder. So the nitrogenous bases are held together by hydrogen bonds. That's what the dotted red lines are. In the middle here, you can see just a close up on a few of those rungs. So we're seeing four rungs in the ladder. Again, the backbone would be the phosphates and the sugar. And then in the middle, we have our nitrogenous bases, which are cyclical structures. Now, one thing to note is that the bases always line up in a very specific way. So adenine and thymine bond together and guanine and cytosine bond together. And note that G and C actually make three hydrogen bonds, A and T makes uh, only two. So we always have this kind of arrangement holding the DNA molecule together. Remember, hydrogen bonds are quite weak, but there's lots of them. So this is a stable molecule. But at the same time, an enzyme called RNA polymerase can come in and just unzip a few of those rungs, just a few at a time, and read the information. And then as that enzyme travels down the middle of the DNA molecule, it will zip back up behind the enzyme. So how does DNA differ from RNA? In a few ways. So first of all, function. Remember that DNA stays put in the nucleus. It's a permanent repository for information. And I should point out that you do have a bit of DNA outside the nucleus. You have DNA within your mitochondria. In each cell, you have about 20,000 genes. 37 of those are in the mitochondria. So not a whole lot, but those genes are quite important. The RNA molecules serve a few different functions. Some of them are found in ribosomes, where they make up part of the structure of the ribosome. Um, but the most important ones make up a molecule known as messenger RNA. Messenger RNA is a copy of the information from one gene in the nucleus. So that information will leave the nucleus. It goes out through pores in the nuclear envelope, that's the double membrane that surrounds the nucleus, finds a ribosome, and then that is translated into a protein sequence, a sequence of amino acids. So DNA stays put, RNA transfers the message to a ribosome. Now there are some structural differences as well. So first of all, where do the names come from? Ribose is a sugar that makes up RNA. Deoxyribose, or technically 2-deoxyribose, is the sugar that's found in uh, DNA. And there's only one slight difference there. Notice that in DNA, we're missing an oxygen on the second carbon. Another difference is that RNA is single-stranded, whereas DNA is double-stranded. So again, DNA is a double helix. RNA is a single helix. RNA is a more fragile molecule because of that. Uh, it can be broken down quite readily. Now, there are a few instances where we might see short little bits of double-stranded RNA in our cells, uh, but we won't get into that. Also, it's kind of interesting in that double-stranded RNA is quite common in many viruses. Again, though, for human cells, RNA is almost always going to be single-stranded. Finally, we have a difference when it comes to the bases, and it's a small difference. In RNA, we have something called uracil, and in DNA, that's replaced by thymine. They are quite similar. Let's talk very briefly about how we name the bits and pieces that make up nucleic acids. For instance, when should you use the term nucleoside, and when should you use the term nucleotide? A nucleoside is a sugar and a base, so we're not including the phosphate here. Normally, you would use the term nucleoside if you're talking about a complete molecule of RNA or DNA, and you're listing off the sequence of bits. You're listing off the sequence of nucleosides. And that's just because you don't care about the phosphate. The phosphate doesn't change the property of that sequence. But if you're talking about the individual pieces, the monomers, and you haven't stuck them together yet, then we use the term nucleotide. So nucleotide refers to the sugar, the base, and the phosphate. Now, both of the examples I've given you here 
our RNA nucleosides and nucleotides. This one here would be a DNA nucleotide. We know it's DNA because there's an oxygen missing where the arrow is, and we call it a nucleotide because we're including the phosphate in our discussion. When we're dealing with nucleotides, we might also want to indicate how many phosphates are attached. So the nucleotides start off with three phosphates attached. When we combine them together to form a molecule of RNA or DNA, two of the phosphates are cut off. Now this is a molecule here which you should recognize at this point, ATP, adenosine triphosphate. The adenosine comes from the name of the base at the top. That's the two ring structure at the top with lots of nitrogen. The T stands for tri, three, and that's because there's three phosphates attached. Incidentally, this is an RNA nucleotide, and we know that because there's an oxygen here. So ATP is used for many things. We've talked about how it's used to shuttle energy around. It's also used to build RNA, and it's used as a signaling molecule. It does lots of stuff. Now, if we take one of the phosphates off, then we have adenosine diphosphate, ADP. If we take two of the phosphates off, then we have adenosine monophosphate, AMP. And in fact, there are some chemical reactions that use ADP to shuttle energy around. A phosphate is pulled off to make AMP and then that's recycled. But we won't get into that stuff. Um, usually it's ATP being converted to ADP and back again. There's one more thing we should talk about briefly. And I'd like to talk about it in a lot more detail, and I will later, but that is what's known as the central dogma of molecular biology. Now, molecular biology is the study of DNA and how DNA is used to make proteins and how this whole system functions. And that's my background, so I would very much like to talk more about it, but I'm gonna keep it really, really uh, short. The central dogma suggests something very simple, DNA is used as a template to make copies of itself. DNA is used as a template to make RNA. RNA is used as a template to make proteins. So DNA can split into two strands and then enzymes will come along and copy the existing strands to replace the second strand. And that's replication of DNA. And that happens whenever a cell is getting ready to divide. Transcription is the process whereby the information found in DNA is used to make a copy in RNA. And finally, translation is where the information in RNA is used to make a protein. So the information that's found in DNA and then RNA is a code. It's a code for amino acids. So each amino acid can be coded for by three nucleosides. The other thing to note is that this central dogma applies to all living things. Now, viruses, some of them can do things a bit differently. They're also not usually considered to be alive. Also, a gene is a unit of DNA, a segment of DNA that codes for one polypeptide. So you have over 20,000 genes, they code for different proteins. And it's a bit more complicated than that, but that's as far as we need to go uh, for the moment. Now, because this applies to all living things and because all living things follow the same code, you can take a piece of DNA from a bacterial cell and you can put that into an animal cell and the animal cell will decode that DNA and use it to make a protein. Another really nice example going the other way, the production of insulin. So insulin is a protein, it's a hormone, and before we were getting into genetic engineering and so on, the only way to get insulin in large quantities for people that needed it, people that were diabetic, was to collect it from horses. That was a really labor intensive job. And also horse insulin is slightly different than human insulin. It doesn't work quite as well as it could. But what we do now, and we've done this actually for decades now, is we've taken the gene from human cells that codes for insulin, taking that gene, put it into bacteria, and now the bacteria will read that information 
and they will convert that information into a protein. Insulin is not something they need. It's not something that would normally be there, but the information is there and they have to decode it. Basically, they have to decode it and use it to make protein. And then we can grow up um, insulin in bacteria and in yeast cells. We can grow it up in huge amounts and purify it and we get pure human insulin. So to sum up, once again, we've got DNA, double-stranded molecule, stays put within the nucleus. It can be unzipped just a little bit at a time, and the exposed nucleosides can be read by an enzyme called RNA polymerase that will make a copy of that message in RNA. Now remember, DNA and RNA are both made up of nucleosides. So we are transcribing or copying the information from DNA to RNA, but we're not changing the language. I like to think of the monomers as kind of an alphabet. Now the RNA is going to leave the nucleus and go out to the cytoplasm. RNA is made up of nucleosides. Proteins are made up of amino acids. We're going to use the information in the messenger RNA to manufacture a sequence of amino acids and we're changing the language here. We're changing the alphabet. We're going from uh, nucleosides to amino acids. And how this works is that the nucleotides form what are called codons. And this consists of just three nucleosides. Three nucleosides will code for an amino acid. So all of the 20 different amino acids can be coded for by a sequence of three nucleosides. So we're done. We have a cell that has structure. It has something to eat. It can do things and it can also store and transmit information. The DNA stores information on how to make protein. And then the proteins do everything else, including replicating the DNA and transcribing the DNA into RNA. And here's what an actual complete cell looks like. Genetics, as we'll see, is based upon an underlying principle known as the central dogma of molecular biology. And it's not nearly as frightening as it sounds. It simply states that cells contain DNA as their genetic material. DNA contains information, and that information is passed down from one generation to the next. To do that, of course, DNA has to be replicated. So before a cell divides, we have to have two copies of that information. DNA serves as a template to make RNA. And then RNA is used by ribosomes to make proteins. So DNA is transcribed into RNA, and then it's translated by a ribosome to make protein. The information that's contained within DNA and RNA is information needed to arrange amino acids in a particular sequence. So DNA is our genetic or hereditary material, and protein, remember, is the functional material of the cell. So proteins are enzymes, enzymes that can manufacture lipids and carbohydrates, enzymes that can do all sorts of things. Proteins are channels, uh, there are motor proteins, etc. So proteins do all the work the DNA is simply the information. Within the DNA, we have discrete sequences that code for particular proteins, and those discrete sequences are known as genes. Now, a lot of people will tell you that the nucleus of a eukaryotic cell is the brain of the cell. I don't really like that analogy. I prefer the analogy of a library. The nucleus is the library, and it contains bookcases filled with books. Each bookcase is a chromosome, and on a particular bookcase, we're going to have a particular set of books. Each of those books is a gene, and each one of those books contains the blueprints for one particular protein. Bacteria, of course, don't have a nucleus. Now, they still have genetic information, they have DNA, of course, but they have it in one great big circle. And that's not contained in a separate compartment. So the first step, transcription, where we take DNA and use that to make messenger RNA, 
that would occur within the nucleus in a eukaryotic cell. And then the messenger RNA that resulted would have to move out into the cytosol and find a ribosome. Well, in bacteria cells, that messenger RNA gets dumped into the cytosol immediately. And then we have ribosomes that are nearby in contact with the DNA in some cases that can then translate it immediately. This speeds up the process quite a bit. In fact, as transcription is occurring before the messenger RNA has even detached from the DNA, it can already be in the process of translation. And this is one of the reasons that bacteria can divide and do stuff really, really quickly. Alrighty then, let's start by taking a look at the structure of DNA. The structure was unraveled, so to speak, by Watson and Crick back in 1953. Now they didn't do their own empirical lab work, what they did was they looked at the findings of many other scientists. They compiled those findings and came up with a working model of DNA. You can see them doing that in this classic photograph. So they have scrounged the lab for various bits of equipment, retort stands, etc., to make a working model. They published a groundbreaking paper that was actually only one page long, you're seeing half of it, right there that contained their model. And this was a really big deal, of course. Uh, if you go to Cambridge, you can still see the stained glass windows that were erected in their honor. Now, DNA was discovered quite a bit earlier, in 1869, in fact. And we knew quite a bit about the components of nucleic acids, RNA and DNA, before Watson and Crick came along. We just didn't know how those bits and pieces were stuck together. Nucleic acids are built using nucleotides, and each nucleotide has three parts. It has a phosphate group, a sugar, and a nitrogenous base. The nitrogenous bases are so named because they contain quite a bit of nitrogen, as you can see. And the nitrogenous bases come in five varieties. We have one group known as the purines, and they're wider. They contain two organic rings. And then we have a second group known as the pyrimidines that are narrower, consisting just of a single ring. We have adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine in DNA. In RNA, we have the same, except thymine is replaced by uracil. Let's take a look at the sugars that are found in nucleic acids. And we'll start with the sugar that's found in RNA. That sugar is known as ribose, and RNA stands for ribonucleic acid. So the name makes sense. Note that we have five carbons, and they're numbered one through five. Actually, they're numbered one prime through five prime. The first four carbons, together with an oxygen, form a pentagon. Note that on the two prime carbon, we have a hydroxyl group, an OH. Now, if we take ribose and we remove the oxygen from that location, we get deoxyribose. D means without. Oxy refers to oxygen. So we have removed one oxygen from that sugar. And that's the only thing we've done to change it to deoxyribose. Technically, if you want to be 100% correct, it's 2-deoxyribose. The 2 tells you that the oxygen is missing from that second carbon. Nucleotides are linked together in a chain using what's called a condensation or dehydration synthesis reaction. And we talked about these in Biology 111. Remember that all polymers in living cells are made through this reaction where two monomers come together and a water molecule is drawn off, hence the condensation or dehydration. So we have nucleotides that are coming into this growing chain. Those nucleotides will have three phosphates attached to them. That's not shown in this diagram. Two of the phosphates would be removed, leaving one. That one phosphate so we're looking at the nucleotide on the bottom left here, has an exposed hydroxyl group. And it's going to interact with the exposed hydroxyl group on the three prime carbon of 
the existing strand. The hydroxyl group from the phosphate and the hydrogen from that three prime carbon are going to combine to give us our water and we have a bond forming. The linkage between the nucleotides is known as a phosphodiester linkage. And this is what happens in both RNA and DNA to build a strand of nucleotides. RNA consists of a single chain of nucleotides. That chain forms a strand and that strand is twisted. It's a spiral or helix. DNA consists of two helical strands of nucleotides twisted around each other. And that's why Watson and Crick refer to this molecule as the double helix. What you're seeing here are three different representations of this molecule. Let's take a look at the one in the middle first. In a DNA molecule, we have two strands and each one of those strands has a backbone. The backbone is made up of alternating phosphates and sugars. So we have a backbone here on the left, and we have another backbone here on the right. Now, if you look at the diagram on the left, that backbone is represented by blue ribbons. So we have a backbone here, and we have another backbone over here. The two backbones are going to be held together by our nitrogenous bases. The nitrogenous bases always pair up in a very specific way. So adenine, A, binds to thymine, T. Cytosine, C, binds to guanine, G. Note that we have two hydrogen bonds that hold A and T together, and we have three hydrogen bonds that hold C and G together. So the nucleotides will always pair up in a way where they get the maximal number of hydrogen bonds. In fact, if you have a sequence of DNA that has a lot of Gs and Cs, there will be more hydrogen bonds holding the two strands together and you'll have a stronger molecule. The other thing to note when we look at the backbones is that they're arranged in opposite directions. Take a look at the position of the oxygen on the pentose sugar. It's different. And that's because of the way that strands have to be built. As we talked about before, new nucleotides have to be added to the three prime hydroxyl. On the right, you're seeing a space filling model of the DNA molecule. And note again that we have two strands that are wrapped around each other. They're twisted around each other to form this double helix. The two strands of nucleotides that are found in a DNA molecule are said to be complementary. And what I mean by that is that A is always gonna pair up with T. So A is complementary to T. C is always gonna match up with G. So C is complementary to G. So you can see now that if we took the two strands and separated them and looked at just one strand, we could figure out the sequence of the other strand. It would be complementary to the first strand. The two strands are also said to be anti-parallel. And that refers to the fact that the two strands are oriented in opposite directions. Once again, that relates back to the way that they have to be built new nucleotides have to be added to a three prime hydroxyl. And that means that our sugars are going to be oriented in opposite directions. To sum up, RNA and DNA are similar when it comes to their components, but they're a bit different in the way that they're built. So first of all, in RNA, the sugar molecule is slightly different it has an extra oxygen. Or another way to think about that is that DNA is missing an oxygen. RNA is single stranded. We have one helix. That makes RNA a rather delicate molecule. There are lots of enzymes in the cell and 
on the surface of your body, etc., that will gobble up RNA and break it quite easily. Finally, remember that RNA contains uracil in place of thymine. This was a very quick introduction to DNA and RNA, just focusing on the structure of those molecules. What we're going to do next is look at their function, look at how they work, and that's the really interesting part. What happens if there's a mutation in DNA? What happens if something goes wrong when we're decoding that DNA in our cells? So we're gonna focus on that. We're gonna look at how DNA is passed from one generation to the next. So we'll talk about heredity. We'll talk about genetic disorders. So things that can go wrong. We'll also talk about how DNA can be manipulated. We know enough about DNA now that we can change those sequences. And because DNA is used by all cells, we can actually take DNA from one organism to another organism. So take foreign DNA, put it into another cell, and bring about some things that would not normally happen in that cell. We'll talk about why we might do that, and also, of course, the ethical issues of that.